Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to you on this Memorial Sunday. I invite you to turn and share a warm greeting with those scattered about you. Pastor Suzanne has taken a well-deserved week off this past week to spend time with her family in Nashville. And Young has taken off this Sunday as well, so today you get to be entertained by two subs. And thanks to Jilda for being our musician today, and thanks to Brent and Lyra Lee for being our ushers and acolyte. I failed to get those in the bulletin on Wednesday. Please take note of the announcements. Uh, I think maybe Bible study resumes this week, but I'm not 100% certain of that, so you might check with Suzanne. And as always, let us remember those on our special thoughts and prayers list. Now, as we join together in a spirit of worship, celebration, and fellowship, let us remember those words by Ralph Waldo Emerson that constitute today's thought for meditation. What greater calamity can fall upon a nation than the loss of worship? I invite you to join in singing number 383. <laughs> Let us pray. O God of life, as we again gather here in this chapel this day, we are grateful for the lives we have been given. And when we think about the miracle of life and how wondrously we are made, it astounds us. We are also most grateful for loved ones gone before us who blessed our lives and in many ways helped shape us and make us who we are today. And we are grateful for those serving in the armed forces, especially those from this congregation and those of the past who gave their lives for the causes of freedom and justice. May we live our lives worthy of the lives we have been given and worthy of those who have sacrificed for us. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to join me in the responsive reading today from A. Powell Davies, A World Made Good. O God who has given us the vision of a world made beautiful and good, When it seems to us that all before us is dark. When mistrust and doubt are upon us and we are battling bleakly with despair.
Help us, O oh God, to keep close company with their spirits. Today is the day of the church year when we remember with gratitude and in reverence United Church members and family members who have passed from us since last Memorial Day. So today we remember these United Church members who have passed from us. David Allison. John Murray, Dorothy Dot Keller, Helen Norman, Pat Cobb, and John James. Former United Church members who have passed this past year, Susan Hickman Paris, Marion Nelson, Reverend James Spicer, Family members, Janet Powell's mother, Thelma Powell, and grandson, James Joyce. Lee Robertson's mother, Sarah Robertson. 
John Job's brother, David F. Job. Raphael Herman's brother, or father, Pierre Herman. And Karen Buckley's sister, Sherry Wilson. Frederick Beekner wrote, when you remember me, it means that even after I die, you can still see my face and hear my voice and speak to me in your heart. May we have a moment of silent meditation as we remember these members and family members who have passed from us and how each of them may have touched our lives. Okay, do we have young ones who would like to come forward for a moment together? Morning, Elium. Thank you for coming up today. Well, you know it's been time to plant seeds. Uh, have you, your parents, planted any seeds this spring? Flower seeds, vegetable seeds? Maybe your mom did. It's been that time for a while, hasn't it? Well, when I was uh, your age, about your age, I sold packets of seeds in the spring to make some spending money. I saw an advertisement in a farm magazine inviting kids like myself to order a box of seeds, sell them, then send back part of the money from the sales and keep the rest for myself. So my grandmother helped me go through the list of seeds and pick out 50 packs of seeds that she thought people would buy, like green beans and flower seeds and corn seeds and so forth. And then I placed the order after a couple of weeks, this box came in the mail, and then I started up our street, knocking on doors, relatives and neighbors, asking them if they would like to buy some seeds. And after I sold all 50 packs of seeds, I sent two-thirds of the money to the seed company, and I got to keep the rest. That was actually my first job. So seeds are important because, of course, we need the fruits and vegetables that come from the seeds to live, don't we? But you know what? I've been thinking that things we do and say in our daily lives are sort of like good seeds, seeds of a different kind that, that we plant each day or each week. When we say good words or uh, perform good actions that help others and help make the world a better place, it's like we are planting seeds. Can you think of something we might say or something we might do that might be f considered a good seed that we would plant in the world? Something we might say? When you compliment someone, what they're wearing or what they're doing, you're doing a good job. Or I love you. Or you're really important. Things like that. Or when we do, do things, you know, like uh, being a friend to someone who is sad or taking up for someone who's being bullied or uh, giving to someone who is in need. All of these are like uh, good spiritual seeds that we plant in the world. And we never know when we do plant a good seed by complimenting someone or doing someone to help them. They may decide that they will go and pass it on and compliment somebody else and do a good deed to help somebody else. So whenever we say or do anything that involves love, compassion, truth, justice, and so on, it's like we are planting good seeds in the world. And the time is always right for planting those types of seeds. We may only plant 
this type of seeds in the spring or early summer, but it's always the right time to plant spiritual seeds. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the time is always right to do what is right. The time is always right to plant seeds of love, compassion, justice, and truth. Thank you for coming up. I hope you have fun in Sunday school. And now I invite you to join in singing number 314. Moses of old is quoted as having said, Remember how the Lord your God has blessed you in everything you have done. We of all people are most blessed. May we share from what we have received so that the lives of others may be blessed as well.
O God, whose giving indeed knows no ending, in gratitude for all we have received and in hope for a better world, we share our gifts this day and always. And to your honor, amen. Our first reading today comes from the prophet Isaiah. God the Lord created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. He gives breath to everyone, life to everyone who walks the earth. And it is he who said, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them, and you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. And our second reading from the second letter to Timothy. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Will you again join me in a time of prayer and silent reflection? O oh God, what a joy and a privilege it is to gather here in the stillness of this sacred place where so many faithful people have gathered over the decades to worship, to search for you, consider the workings of divine grace in their lives, to celebrate baptisms and marriages, to say goodbye to their loved ones, and to hear words of comfort, hope, and a call to action. So as we remember those gone before us, our reasons for gathering here today are many and varied. But as we do so, the world outside rages about us. Wars between nations. Untold destruction and human suffering political battles that threaten to tear our nation apart, devastating effects of climate change that are leading to loss of life and property. The list is long and disturbing. So in humility and hope, we pray for a better world. But just for a little while this day, and every time we gather here, may we find sanctuary, a sense of peace and calm, and a clearer vision of who we are, who we can become, and how we can make a small difference in our families, church, community, and wider world. 
Such are our spoken prayers, and now we would offer the silent reflections of our hearts. Would it really make any difference if the church weren't here? Isn't the church as an institution out of touch with 21st century concerns? After all, the church and its basic beliefs are over 2,000 years old, aren't they? Do we really need to continue to support the church financially? Bottom line, does the church really matter? Now, let me be quick to add that those questions are not my questions. And those sentiments are not my sentiments. But aren't they the thinking and questioning of many of our day when the percentage of Americans who attend church at least once a month is at an all-time low of 30%. If we were to go by the numbers alone, it would seem that some 70% of Americans, at least by their body language and either consciously or unconsciously, hold the view that church no longer matters. In November, <clears throat> Pastor Suzanne and the United Church Diversity Committee sponsored the first Table Talks gathering. There have been two more Table Talks gatherings since then, I think. But at that first Table Talk, some 40 of us enjoyed a meal as we sat around at tables of four people each, and we responded to questions that helped us get to know each other better what it was or how it was that each of us came to the United Church and what aspects of church life are most important to us and so on. And one question that we responded to at that first table talk was why is the church important? I appreciated that question very much and as I continued to think about it days and weeks later I decided that exploring that question deeper would make for a legitimate and perhaps an interesting and timely sermon. Uh, so here it is. I'm going to share with you in a minute my answer, somewhat expanded of course, to the question of why church matters. But I am not saying that your answers regarding why church might matter have to exactly agree with my answers, but hopefully my answers will resonate somewhat and give some food for thought. And I've always believed that if my sermons give people something to think about the following week, then they have done what they were supposed to do. But I submit to you that the church matters because it provides religious community. I see the church community as being different from other communities to which we might belong. Civic organizations such as Rotary, Kiwanis, Exchange Club, Lions, and so on are wonderful organizations that do a lot of wonderful work in the world. And they do offer opportunities for fellowship. But as a religious community, the church is different, I believe. The church is built around shared religious and moral beliefs and values, such as love, compassion, forgiveness, service, and justice. In religious community, we seek to live together, or we should be seeking to live together, according to the principles that Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. 
in religious community, we share a common goal of a search for God as our congregation's historic motto reminds us, where people from all denominations meet in their differences but are one, become one in their search for God. And the church as a religious community provides space to do that. But as a religious community, the church also gives us space to question and together search for answers from a religious, spiritual perspective for life's perplexing, moral, ethical, and existential questions. I also submit to you that the church matters because it encourages and engages in service to the world. As the prophet Isaiah points out, the people of God exist to be a servant to the world. The church should never feel that it exists for itself alone, just to serve its own needs, interests, and desires. Rather, the church should collectively be seeking ways to make a positive difference in the world by meeting the needs of people around it and helping to alleviate human suffering. And to this end, churches over the centuries have found hundreds of ways to make a positive difference in the world through starting hospitals, nursing homes, and assisted living facilities. Churches have provided food banks, soup kitchens, clothes closets, and homeless shelters for those in need. Churches have started counseling centers for the troubled, provided sanctuary for those in danger, and sponsored domestic violence shelters for mother, abused mothers and children. Churches sponsor mission trips to those less fortunate in developing countries and the poverty-stricken communities of America. And on and on the list goes, as German pastor Author and anti-Hitler activist Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it, the church is the church only when it exists for others. But in addition to being a servant to the world in the collective sense, the church should also encourage service to the world by its individual members. In fact, the church might be looked upon as an equipping station to equip and train members to go out into the world to serve. In that spirit, members accept the challenge to be servant to the community, community by volunteering at such places as that communal storehouse to assist those in dire need and help them get back on their feet by providing basic household items. Members volunteer at the local hospital, offering encouragement and hope to the sick and dying. Members volunteer at those soup kitchens or food banks that other churches started, and organizations such as ADFACT and TORCH that also help struggling families get back on their feet. Members jump in to help their neighbors in need in the spirit of Christ. So being a servant to the world and encouraging service to the world is the second reason that the church matters. Third, the church matters because it serves as a voice of conscience to the community and wider world. I have had a lifelong love affair with the church and the American pulpit even as an adolescent, I was fascinated by churches as we traveled to new places on vacation. Look, there's a church, I would exclaim as we were on our way to Myrtle Beach when I would see an interesting church building. I guess my parents just looked at each other and, with a funny sort of look on their face. And regarding church buildings, I love the historic, 
white framed New England Congregational and Universalist churches. But even more, I admire the American pulpit because over the centuries, the American pulpit has been a voice of conscience to society. From the American pulpit, brave abolitionist preachers spoke out against the evils of the slave trade and called for an end to it. During the civil rights movement, brave preachers used their pulpits to expose the evils of Jim Crow laws and abuse and lynchings of black people. The church and the pulpit should call its members, the community, and the wider world to rise up to their best self. And the pulpit should call the nation to account when it is blatantly wrong. As Isaiah the prophet puts it, as the church, the people of God, we are called to see that justice is done on the earth. We are to shed light on those pressing issues of the day by framing them in a religious moral framework. And we are called to help set free those who are held in various forms of human bondage and the prisons of oppression, prejudice, and abuse. And as the author of the second letter to Timothy reminds the young preacher, he or she is to use the church's pulpit to preach the word, to preach the message, whether it is comfortable to do so or not, to convince, reproach, and encourage, even though there are those who follow their own desires, those who are resistant to the truth. Bear with me as I say we might easily change the verse in 2 Timothy to read, they will turn from listening to the truth and give their attention to baseless conspiracy theories and other myths and legends. Now granted, the church and its individual preachers who have stood in their pulpits have not always been right. But if the church is being its best self, and if preachers are being their best self and being what they are called to be, then the church and the pulpit become the needed voice of conscience to the community and world. As they call people to look at life from a religious moral perspective that is based upon truth, justice, and what is right. And so I give you three reasons, my top three reasons, which could have been developed in the three different sermons, why the church matters. The church provides religious community, the church encourages and engages in service to the world, and the church serves as a voice of conscience that calls its members, the community, and the wider world to put away evil and injustice and rise up to its best self. And in light of all that, how terrible it would be if the church and the pulpit were to go away. How terrible it would be if the collective church in America were no longer active and present to be that religious voice of conscience. How terrible it would be if this united church and other progressive churches like it with the unique message we have to share were to cease to exist. And on this Memorial Sunday, we would be remiss if we fail to remember those faithful United Church members who have gone before us courageously, who sacrificed to give us this unique community of faith we have today. So, is the church really important? Does the church really matter? Is this church really relevant for today's concerns? Yes, yes, and yes. So does our support through this church 
with our attendance and what we can give in volunteer time and money really matter and make a difference? You bet your bottom dollar it does. When all is said and done, church matters. And church matters so much, we cannot begin to fathom what a great loss there would be if the church were no longer here. Amen. And I invite you to go forth as we sing together number 76. May we leave here this day with a renewed commitment to the church and the ministry and service it makes possible and the voice of conscience the church provides. And may the favor of God and the blessings of God in this church be with us all. Amen. Amen.